happens, I just press the let's go live button, which means we've got to wait for the stream to fire up all across the fruited plane of the internet. We got to go ahead and adjust a couple settings over here because we sat down and got carried away. So we're going to swap it over, press that button. We're going to click this button. We've got another button right there. Uh, that mode is going on. It's this mode plus this mode and just a couple clicks and boom. I think we got all the tubes situated appropriately, which is good news. That means we can go ahead and get started. So let's do it, shall we? Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live, the show that spotlights misconduct involving police, prosecutors, and politicians. My name is Robert Govea. I am a criminal defense attorney. And today, we've got Trump trials to attend to, my friends, a lot of them. Of course, we're going to be starting off with the big one. We've got Don Jr. and Eric Trump testifying in New York City. This is the case involving Tishy Tish James, who is prosecuting the Trump businesses and uh, going after the entire family. Don Jr. was there. You can see that was a photograph of him. Here's another photograph. Eric was next to testify. And so we're going to be going through both of those individuals' uh, testimonies today. And those are coming courtesy of Klasfeld reports over on the X platform. And so we're going to go through all that and do our interpretive X interpretation of what's happening inside the courtrooms since cameras are not allowed inside. Then we're also going to take a look at what's happening on the January 6th cases because there's a bunch of filings coming out. This case is going to really, really get busy quickly. We've already got jury selection, which I think is going to be starting in February of next year, which means we're just months away. If it's November already, we're going to have jury selection in February. So we're going to have a trial in March. It's going to be here before you know it. So Trump is demanding pre-trial subpoenas because he wants to go get some January 6th footage. And Shutkin denied his defense team access to what are called ex parte filings, which means the government is submitting stuff to the judge and Trump can't even see what is being submitted. And it has to do with classified documents. And I know what you're saying, Rob, you're talking about Shutkin. This is Washington, D.C. This is not the classified documents case. Hello, that's true. But there are classified documents in J the J6 case as well. And it looks like Trump's team may not even be able to see them. So we're going to go through all of that and more when we get there. And then in our final segment, we're going to talk about what's happening over in Colorado. You remember this guy, his name's Ken Buck, Representative Ken Buck. And he's been a very interesting fella here. We've had a lot of conversations about him. He gets a little bit um, interesting when he comments on what's happening in the media, talking about Republicans. And in fact, he is going to be retiring, not running for office again. But he has come back and he testified today in the Colorado removal trial proceeding. We're going to hear from him, but we got a bunch of other testimony. We've got Amy Kramer, who testified. She was a member over at the Stop the Steal rally. And she explains the crowd, a lot of testimony from her earlier this morning. And she's going to describe the crowd, peaceful, loving, very patriotic, not insurrectionists. And so we're trying to counterbalance the, t the testimony that came in earlier in the week. And so we'll hear from Amy. We've also got this guy. His name is Thomas Van Flyn, and he is Representative Gosar's or, or was his chief of staff. I don't know if he still is currently, but he was explaining that he saw some other stuff there like BLM and other people causing a ruckus, not the so-called Trump people who were there. And then we're going to turn over to this guy. Another Colorado individual works at the Colorado Republican Party. He's a treasurer. Name is Thomas Borkland. And he's saying the crowd's very diverse. Hey, hey man, there were even Asians for Trump there. Shout out to Asians for Trump. And so he'll explain that. And then we've got a couple clips of Ken Buck, who is retiring. And he was basically testifying on behalf of the Trump side, saying that the January 6th report, which really makes up the basis for a lot of this stuff, is just not valid. It is not complete. Why? Because they do not have the full report. The minority report from the minority party has not been included in the, the J6 committee thing. And so we'll hear from Ken Buck and see what he has to say about all of this. But as you can see, my friends, we've got some serious business to attend to. It is a lovely Thursday. We've got uh, a full docket ahead. This morning, we had a great stream for our Membos and our members only stream. 
was great. And for some reason, my node is not here up on uh, the, the screen here. Let me do a refresh. Where'd it go? I don't know where it is. Anyways, we had a great members only stream this morning. And this morning we were talking about this case that took place out of Connecticut. And in Connecticut, there was a ruling. We read through about 30 something pages. It was this judge was ordering a new election. This was a pretty big deal. Judge ordering a new election after massive fraud was discovered in the Democratic primary over there. So you can check that out if you're a member. We'd love to see you on our members only streams. We have a lot of fun on our member streams in the morning. And so you can check that out, watching the watchers.locals.com. We also have Saturday streams. We do after parties after the show is over. And so stick around. If you're a YouTube member, you can also join us for the after parties and all the other goodies by becoming a YouTube member. But just for the after party, grab the Telegram link, which you'll find on YouTube in the community tab section. Navigate over there and grab the Telegram link. Also want to invite you to check out our website. If you click over to robertcovea.com, You can sign up for our daily newsletter so you can get stuff delivered to your inbox. All of these show reports, you can see we've got our reports up from yesterday. And you can see that is just something that will be delivered to your inbox with the PDFs, all of these summaries. So if you can't stick around for the full show and see what's happening, sign up for the newsletter. Very easy to do it. You just click this home button, click click here for instant access, boom, sign up, and it will be coming in every morning. Now today, we are going to have uh, some live stream privilege sponsors. So we'll have a couple inserts where we, I, don't do, I won't do a full read, but we're going to be uh, working with ground.news slash RGE. So if you're interested in a really cool news app, it's ground news is very cool. You can check this out. We've got a great promo, ground.news slash RGE, and you'll see more of that if you watch these segments later. And if you want a great news app, that's uh, how you can get it. So we'll have some live stream privileges in the second and the third segments. Just so that you're aware, those are coming up. But without any further ado, we've got trial to attend to. And so let's get right to it, shall we? Don Jr. and Eric Trump testify in the prosecution brought by Tishy Letish James. You know who she is. This was that excerpt from when she was saying that Trump was an illegitimate president with her facial spasms as she was running for office in New York as the attorney general. But she's been mostly uninvolved in the trial other than sitting there and observing and posting X's on the X platform. But today, her office subpoenaed Trump's kids, man. Don Jr. and Eric Trump were brought in to testify. You can see there is Don Jr. And we know that his testimony started yesterday. So we're going to be picking up with him in this day where he is back on the stand and we'll see some cross-examination and redirect potentially. We also are then going to hear from Eric Trump and you can see Eric Trump came into the courtroom and he's seated there with his attorneys and of course he's looking stern, he's looking ready to go, channeling dad and look who we have over here. Well, of course we have Alina Abba, but we also have, look who's there, back sitting behind the bar again. Oh, it's Tish, stuck behind the bar again, sitting in the back of the courtroom. I don't know why that is, because she's got a, a pretty vocal Twitter account, but she's not so communicative when she's actually in the courtroom. She's sitting there like an observer, which is just wild. I, I wonder if she, you know, she's live tweeting this for her blog. Anyways, that's what's happening inside the courtroom. And so now, without any further ado, let's jump right in to the day's proceedings. And of course, we're going over to Adam Klasfeld. He's over at Klasfeld Reports. He's reporting over from The Messenger. Does great work. We're grateful for his reporting. And so make sure you give him a follow and a like and a retweet and a boost and all those things if you can. And so we'll do the same here as well. But this is what he is reporting. We're back in court. Trial back in session. Don Jr. enters the courtroom and he sits down at the defense table, attorney seated in tow. Judge Angeron is in the courtroom and he's jovial this morning. He's got a little bit of a joke to start us off. He says, good morning, everybody. There's no photography allowed in the courtroom. Okay, let the photographers in now. (laughs) Yucking away. So they take a few photographs of Angeron, a photograph. Oh, judge, you're doing such a historic job here prosecuting this thief. Angerong, they turn around to the defense tables, they take their photos, the judge says, all right, get the heck out of here. Trial starts, Tish's attorney, she's sitting in the back there playing Tetris, and her actual person who does some work, her name's Colleen Faherty, Faherty comes out and says, "Uh, good morning, Your Honor, the government bureaucrats on our table, we recall Don Jr. to the stand. Don Jr. walks up there, 
He said, good morning, Don. Hey, good morning. I want to ask, and you start here, did you discuss your testimony that we had with you yesterday with anyone? He says, no, I didn't. Oh, well, that's good. Well, I want to show you an email with a subject line that's dated back from 2017. It says the following, urgent fact-checking inquiry from Forbes, dated March 3rd, 2017. And they ask some questions. They say, do you recognize this? And he says, oh, well. And Don Jr., he says, wow, there's an insane amount of stuff there. She's asking him some detailed questions about the magazines. Don Jr.'s response to the magazine's detailed questions. I mean, what do you think about all this? Fact-checking. He says, insane amount of stuff there. Okay. So that's what Don Jr. wrote, not what he said on the stand. Thank you, Adam, for the clarification. So, backing up. He says that in the email, Don Jr. wrote insane amount of stuff in there. And the email is about a Forbes article. It says, urgent fact-checking inquiry from Forbes. Forbes sends an email. We got some questions for you guys. Don Jr. must have forwarded it, 2017. Insane amount of stuff there. Like, they've got a lot in there. Like, what are they asking about? You better, hey, better look into this, all right? So that's what he wrote. Now, the Forbes press inquiry that evoked the response from Don Jr. was detailed. Okay, so this is what Forbes sent over. Forbes sent this one from Noah Kirsch to a garden at trumporg.com says urgent fact check. Hi, Alan. Hope all's well to a garden. So Alan garden, hope all's well. I'm Noah magazine reporter at Forbes assembling something on the world's billionaires. This is March 3rd, 2017. Okay. So Trump is now in office and they say, you know, so Forbes is going hog wild. These people have like, you know, salivation coming out of their mouths. Let's get Trump and take him out. They're already setting him up with Ukraine, 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 all the spying on his campaign crap. That's all being covered up by the FBI right now because they thought Hillary was going to win. Anyways, so Forbes is at it. They say here, um, you know, a bunch of questions about the Trump organization. How much has ownership changed? Blah, blah, blah. Puerto Rico. Are these documents legitimate? Felix Sater, uh, what about this? Did you have an exclusive deal in Russia? Is this 2017 licensing agreement from the Dominican Republic still intact? Is this Trump penthouse still the, th the same? What is the mechanical space? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so this person's just like giving, you know, the, the organization a rectal exam and they're just thrilled about it because they're working for Forbes. Uh, Noah is very excited about it. So he's like, hey, by the way, I apologize for the late turnaround. Because of our schedule, we'll need answers to whatever you can provide by noon on Monday. All right. So this friggin' jerk sends this email, three pages with like the most in insane list ever. Can you give us questions about this? Everything might be illegitimate. Who knows? And he says, can you get me answers by like noon on Monday? When did this email even come out? Friday. All right. So you got all weekend to figure it out. <laughs> he sends the email Friday, 10 a.m. And he's like, wow, have a nice weekend. Good luck. Have a nice weekend. Otherwise, we're publishing the article on noon on Monday. We're not accepting any changes after 3 p.m. Thanks. You guys are pieces of work, aren't they? So they, then they publish it. And then they say, well, Don, they didn't comment. They didn't respond. They didn't return comment when we asked them for comment. Whatever. So then they say, uh, Don Jr., they ask him a question. Is, you know, tell me about what you thought about that. Can you clarify your statement? Ask him some questions. Don Jr., you know, ask responds to these accounting questions. He says, look, again, Tish's attorney, Faherty, again, for the purposes of accounting, I relied upon the accountants. All right, not complicated. I say, well, all right, well, I want to show you a loan from Deutsche Bank, and it's a, called a Trust Company Americas, dated March 13, 2017. Is this your signature, Don Jr.? He says, uh, yeah, looks like it. And isn't it true that you signed this as attorney in fact? And he says, look, I says, yeah. And you did that for your father. He says, that looks right. And so the document here, if you read it in quote, it says the following, would you agree? Quote, the foregoing presents fairly in all material respects, the financial condition of guarantor at the period presented. Did you see that, Don? Yeah. Did you remember reading that when you signed this document? He says, well, I don't recall this specific document, but yeah, signing certifications like this generally? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure I've signed dozens of these certifications in my time as trustee. You say, huh, interesting. Now, I want to show you another statement of financial condition. Now, this one's back from June 30th, 2017. Now, on this document, I want to just call your attention. It notes that the trustees 
were responsible for the report at the time. So, you know, you might, right? It says the trustees were responsible. Now, John Jr. became a trustee that year, which is the first year of your presidency. So you signed it, meaning you're owning it, right? So then the New York Attorney General, uh, Faherty, repeats a series of questions, probably very boring and dry as they are. And Don Jr.'s involvement in the statements, you know, it goes back 2018, 2019. Rinse and repeat, says Don Jr. Rinse and repeat, okay? Just do your stupid little cycle again. Circle it up, circle it up. She says, okay, take it easy, Don. Now, Don is then shown another certification to Deutsche Bank that he signed back on October 31st. He's certifying these things. That's you? Uh, yeah, that's you? You signed, yeah, that's you? Rinse and repeat, right? I got documents I signed. Now, it also attached to that one a statement of financial condition. So Don, is theoretically, she's making the point that he's certifying these things. And so you signed the certification intending that the bank would rely on it, right? He says, well, I would be fine with them relying on it. And she says, well, I'm going to ask you again. That's not what I asked. You signed the certification intending that the bank would rely on it. And he's dancing around the question, don't know what he's saying, but Judge Engerong just says, well, it's a yes or no. And he says, it's not as simple as a yes or no, not at all. He said, I assume the banks would perform their own due diligence, like they receive a document. And Faherty continues to systematically sign documents, sign certification. Hi, here, how about this one from this month? And how about this one from this year? And how about that one? On and on and on. Yeah. So Trump Jr., he continues to emphasize, he says, advice of lawyers, advice of counsel, advice of my accountants. I signed what they told me to sign. They said it's legit, sign the document. So Faherty's getting a little frustrated. She moves on from Don Jr. and she goes over to Deutsche Bank and others. She goes to another accounting firm called Whitley Penn. She shows Don Jr. his signature. Oh, is this on an agreement to sell Don? He says, let me see. Well, yeah, what's that for? She says, for the Trump Ferry Point Golf Club in the Bronx. Did you sign this one? He says, yeah, I think I did. It looks like I signed it right there. Trump Ferry Point LLC. Now, this line of questioning sparked objections. Trump's defense is objection, objecting. They say, Your Honor, that deal, the one that they're talking about right now in Bronx, it took place last year, okay? The lawsuit was, all, was filed already, and that happened after the filing of the lawsuit. So it's outside the scope. We shouldn't even be talking about it. It's too new. Judge Engeron, of course, says, well, whatever, I'll allow it. I don't care. Talk about whatever you want. And so Faherty argues that the fraudulent statements about the property were the backdrop of that sale. So Ferry Point comes back up again. And the judge finally looks over at Don. And he says, Don Jr., Mr. Trump, did you have anything to do with the statements of financial condition? No, I did not, Your Honor. Now, Faherty has mic trouble. One of her mics dies. Angeron from the bench is like, oh, cheap batteries. I hate those. What brand are they? Rayovac? Oh, the worst. And Faherty grabs another one. She's like, hold on, I've got a Duracell. Not sponsored. She MC says, here all night, folks. Oh, that's funny. What a nice personality. Before continuing her examination. What a funny joke. They, wow, neat. So Don Jr.'s testimony then wraps. She says, no further questions. Puts the mic back in. The mic's is this thing on. Says, nope, all over. And then continues her examination. But it's over. And guess what? Trump's lawyers say, any questions for the defense? No, nope, no further questions. That's it. No cross-examination. Alina and Christopher Keyes are just sitting there like, nice job. Nice job. Five-minute recess. We take a break and we're back. Guess who's up? Uh, Your Honor, Tishy bureaucrat prosecution table. We now call Eric Trump. Eric Trump enters the courtroom, sits down at the defense table. The judge says, does everyone have their makeup on? Uh, now, of course, yesterday, Don Jr. made a joke about the makeup, but everybody forgot about that, obviously, except the judge, for whatever reason. So then the photographers come back in and we're taking photos. So another Tish bureaucrat jumps up. His name's Andrew. Now, he calls the witness to the stand. Your Honor, we call Eric Trump. Eric Trump walks up. I do. Eric Trump is sworn in. 
he deny they say okay well uh, eric mr mr trump did you have any involvement in the statements of financial condition sir right out of the gate or probably you had involvement in the creation of these financial conditions didn't you that is incorrect says eric I never had anything to do with the statements of financial condition. Now, Klasfeld reports, he says that the questioning came up previously. New York Attorney General Andrew, the same guy who's up at the stand, confronted him with some data from a spreadsheet saying that he was involved in the creation of the financial condition statements. So here is some note. Okay, somebody entered this note. We know how in you know businesses you keep logs. I met with somebody. Here's what I did. Keep your minutes. 6-30-2012, per a telephone conversation with Eric Trump. So they show him an email. Now, Eric, I want to show you this email from February 2012. He says, all right, whatever. In the email, Alan Weisselberg, who was the former CFO of the Trump org, who has been convicted, says, before I respond, I want to make sure you and your dad are still going forward with this deal. Your dad did not sound very upbeat about the deal. He spoke about how little we would make and that he did not see himself going to new to North Carolina, et cetera. That's an email from Weisselberg to Trump, Eric Trump. So Eric Trump replied the next day. He says, no, the deal was still on, still on track to move ahead. He said, we have bigger fish to fry, but we have it on the one yard line. Another email exchange. Oh, thanks, Eric. Oh, here's another email for you. This one comes from February 15th. Now, Eric, you're sending this one to Philip Delk, another person. Now, Philip is doing due diligence for the North Carolina Club. Eric sends an email to Delk. He says that his inspection of the company's financials was, quote, bound by confidentiality. Eric tells Delk that the company, quote, without question, had the financial wherewithal to purchase, renovate, and operate this asset. He says, I trust you understand and would appreciate you giving me your reassurance that this will not be distributed. Delk responded to the email. He says, I will limit any communication to the fact that you do have the financial wherewithal to purchase, renovate, and operate the club. So it's Eric is involved in this conversation about this property, long story short. Earlier, they're saying, well, Eric flatly denied, quote, having anything to do with his father's statements of financial condition. And so then the government person comes back out and says, well, what about all those emails? And how about this one, Eric, where you're also communicating with Jeff McConney's in his email from August of 2013. Jeff says to you, hey, Eric, I'm working on your dad's annual financial statement. And he's, you remember that? I don't know what he says, but he says, I've got another one. This one's from August 23rd. He's just walking through the sequence. Jeff McConney says to Eric Trump, I'm working on the notes to Mr. Trump's annual financial statement, and I'd like to include any major construction work that was started, completed, contemplated at our golf courses during the last year example to now. And so again, this is Adam Klasfeld reporting and he starts a new thread. Make sure you're giving him a follow over there. And he gives us a breakdown saying that testimony continues to get spicy. They break and Eric Trump is now trying to thread the needle. Andrew is trying to get this to split. Okay, so Trump is trying to say, Eric is trying to say that I've got awareness of the statements, but I'm not involved in the creation of the statements. I sort of know that we need them. I sort of know that they're coming and going, and I am somebody who might maneuver them around and know of them, but the people who create them, right, those are a different group of people. So Andrew, the government person, is trying to cut through this distinction. He's saying, yeah, but you replied. You were a little bit more involved here. On August 23rd, Eric Trump replied to McConney. He said, all of Doral, Doral will be about 200 million. Do you want the blue monster specifically? Say, so Eric sends an email saying it's gonna be all of Doral will be about 200 million. Do you want the blue monster specifically? 
he tells Amer, right? He's responding to this prosecutor. He says, so you were involved, weren't you? Because of, you said 200 million. So doesn't that show you were involved? And Eric says, no, I, I think where we're getting tripped up is on a distinction on what the info is for. He says, that's where you're getting tripped up. You're questioning why we're using the info, rather what I would imagine is he's arguing rather than the creation of the info. Okay, what is the info for? They say, oh, okay, well, you wanna, you wanna play this game? Well, I've got another email from you, he says. How about this one from February 23rd? It says, we're working on your dad's financial statement, says McConney. And quote, attaching footnotes related to the three European clubs. Remember this? He says, I don't know, maybe. Now he says at the very end, he says with all of the renovations that were done since the last statement in June of 2015, I wanted to ask you if there's anything you wanted to add to or expand in the footnotes. To expand in the footnotes, presumably, of the financial statement. Right. So that in other words, they're trying to say that Eric has some content creation that is going into the document. Is there anything you wanted to add to or expand like you actually drafted it? Do you see where it says that in the email, Don Jr.? I'm sorry, Eric Trump. He says, yeah, he says you understood that he was attaching what he was attaching was a draft portion of your dad's financial statements. You understand it was a draft, don't you? Yes or no? Yes. Now I wanna show you this portion of a video deposition from earlier in the year. Was this testimony under oath? Eric said, yes. Now they play a little clip of it, but it's not this exact snippet from the same interview. And so Eric gives some testimony. Is your testimony under oath? He says, yes. In the new testimony, Eric Trump could be heard denying involvement. He says, nope, I wasn't involved in the statement of financial condition and I didn't send McConney any information to be used in it. They play some more video. Eric Trump in the video says, quote, I know nothing about the statement of financial condition. I don't know anything about the backup of the statement of financial condition. It's just not what I did. Do you remember saying that? He says, yeah. They play another clip. Do you have any reason to believe after this clip? Do you have any reason to believe that McConney, this is in the de depot still, referenced a conversation with you if it didn't happen? He said, no. But he didn't have any understanding of what the information was for this financial condition, the statement of the financial condition. They say, thank you, Eric. Now we wanna move on to this property called Seven Springs. They take a break, but we skip it and we're back. Uh, Mr. Eric Trump, I wanna ask you about these 71 units at the Trump National Golf Club. Do you remember this email exchange from August of 2013? It is from, it looks like this person, David McArdle, who's a senior managing director he says, hey, Eric, attached is the revised appraisal proposal totaling $12,500. I hope this works for you and we can move forward. Thank you for the opportunity. All right, so he's, gonna, he's an appraiser, a valuation and advisory person. Eric Trump is shown in another email about his worth with McArdle on the project. They say, Eric, David McArdle, this is a follow-up to confirm that you're going to be providing support from your brokers for the potential pricing of the 71 residential units. We also discussed obtaining input from your construction contractors on the per square foot cost to build the project. At this time, we're moving forward with the discounted cash flow analysis and look forward to the pricing and the cost estimates from your team. Enjoy the weekend, Dave. More exchanges. Now, Eric is showed a notation on this spreadsheet. He says there was something attached to that email. It says here on one row in the spreadsheet, it says per a telephone conversation with Eric Trump, leave the value as is. Do you see that? Yeah. Do you remember that? No. Do you have any reason to doubt that that conversation happened? No. Well, now I want to talk about this other issue. 
you said that when we interviewed you, that I really haven't been involved in appraisal work on the property. Is that true? He says, yeah, that's true. I really haven't been involved in appraisal work on the property. He said that was accurate. So you stand by your testimony in your deposition that you hadn't been involved in appraisal work at the Seven Springs property. He says, well, I was clearly involved in small points. He says, perfect, I know. So you'll concede then, since you were involved in a small bit, that your testimony was a lie. It was false, wasn't it? You said, I don't focus on appraisals between a lot. He says, He said, you said, I don't focus on appraisals between a law firm and a real estate company called Cushman and Wakefield, but you did. You did focus on appraisals, didn't you, in these emails? He says, no. He says, no, I don't focus on appraisals between a law firm and Cushman. These are emails from 10 years ago. I don't even know the person's name. Now, this person obviously testified earlier in the trial. So Tish's prosecutor comes back out and says, I want to show you some testimony from another Trump organization executive. His name's Patrick Burney from earlier in the trial. They were talking about a meeting, a change evaluation meeting between Eric Trump and Don Jr. They say, Eric, you consider Patrick Burney to be a solid guy, wouldn't you? He says, I like Patrick Burney very much. And you considered Patrick Burney to be a solid guy. Eric Trump looks at and gestures to the judge. He says, yeah, yeah. Then the judge looks at him and carry on. So then the government says, Eric, I want to ask you about how you started to learn about Tish's investigation into your family. Now, Cliff Robert jumps up to object. Trump's defense. He says, your honor, I object. Tish's office is trying to sensationalize the trial by, in, by causing Eric Trump to invoke his Fifth Amendment. He says, well, that's exactly right. That's exactly the direction I was going. And he says, it's very relevant. Cliff Roberts, Robert notes, he says, the subject matter is coming at the end of the day when it could dominate the news cycle. So they're just trying to cause a bunch of ruckus here. And Christopher Keyes from Trump's defense jumps in and says, I don't know what else other than sensationalizing is the issue or if it, this is just harassing the issue. Now, Angeron tears into Keyes after he refers to the clerk. So Keyes is, is just outright. I don't know what else other than sensationalizing this issue is or if it's just harassing. And by the judge, your clerk is constantly bringing in your ear, blah, blah, blah. And Angeron says, Mr. Keyes. I have made many admonitions in this courtroom not to refer to my court clerk slash girlfriend. Do not refer to my staff again. She's a civil servant and a total babe, so leave her alone. Sometimes I think there's a bit of misogyny in you, Christopher, in referring to my female principal law clerk, who I'm madly in love with. And Alina jumps up. Alina Abba goes, your honor, excuse me. I've known Mr. Christopher Keese for years. He's an upstanding man of honor and integrity. Any allegations of misogyny are totally unfounded. And I assure you that's not the issue. Subtext meaning the issue is your clerk is whispering in your ear because you don't know what the hell you're doing. And she's giving you orders from who knows who. She says, your honor, I will tell you this, it's not misogynistic. I'm a woman and your clerk's conduct has been inappropriate in this courtroom. Angeron pounds the table, oh! asserting his right to protect the clerk. I am in love. It's not a security issue. I protect mine. He says he has to make a record if he sees potential bias and that's why I'm doing it. And Christopher Keyes jumps up. He says, your honor, I'm not a misogynist. I've got a 17 year old daughter. How dare you say that?
And on that fiery note, trial is done for the day. More soon from Adam Klasfeld over at The Messenger. Okay. <laughs> and so this actually turned into a big deal, right? There was a story about this. And let's see if Adam fills it in for us. And I think he did. But there's, uh, there was a lot going on there, right? So the judge was very unhappy about this. And we'll see what happens tomorrow when it comes back in. But this is over at The Messenger. This is Adam Klasfeld's report. So come on over here. Make sure you give his work a follow and a like. We're grateful for the reporting. But that, my friends, is what happened in court. The judge protecting his court clerk, protecting her honor, which is also ridiculous, okay? Now, the judge has threatened, I saw elsewhere, to expand the gag order to cover the attorneys because the attorneys are apparently not allowed to comment on the improprieties by other people in the courts, right? If you really want to talk about free speech, we can talk about why it's inappropriate to condemn an illegitimate institution. That's the whole point of the First Amendment. It's to petition for a redress of grievances. It's to talk and to bring people to our side to say that what we're watching happening in court is unjust and illegitimate. That extends to the judge. It extends to the clerk and everybody else who's involved in the case. That's what happens when you weaponize the system and free speech is the only safety valve to escape the tyranny. And so we'll keep talking about the judge's girlfriend or whatever as we're here. Now, Don Jr. is done. Eric Trump is very likely to be back tomorrow and on the next day. So we'll be here, my friends. I hope you join us as we continue to cover this. Thank you for liking this video. Thank you for subscribing and sharing this with a friend or family member so that they can see what's happening inside the courtrooms and unpack the truth of what they're trying to do to Trump. All right, my friends. Now, we're not done yet. We got a lot more to get to. And we're going to jump over on the road and go to Washington, D.C., just a short trip away from New York. And we're back with Chetkin. Donald Trump demanding subpoenas to get access to those missing January 6 records. And this is Judge Chutkin's courtroom. So we're going to go through two filings today. The motion for the pretrial subpoenas that Donald Trump's team has submitted as a reply. And we'll see if the judge issues a ruling on this because we want those records. And we're also going to see that Judge Chutkin denied Trump and his defense team access to some very important documents. Documents that Trump's team has not even seen yet in filings that have already made their way to the judge. In other words, Jack Smith is being allowed to send the government materials that nobody can see and that Trump's defense can't even see because this is a show trial that's taking place in America. Now we're gonna go through both filings, but let's start off with the subpoenas because boy, we like when we get some subpoena activity and Trump's team filed the following. It's seven pages and you can see it is submitted as a reply, which means this is Trump's final word to get these subpoenas authorized. Telling the judge, your honor, President Trump has already moved for permission to get pre-trial subpoenas to force the production of records aimed at recovering documents and recordings that the January 6th Select Committee did not properly archive. They have records that are missing, we need them, they have not given them to us, and so we're gonna to have to get a subpoena. Including video recordings, records that the committee transferred to government agencies on the last business day. So Liz Cheney's committee gave to someone else before they dissolved it. Trump is seeking these records concerning the disposition of these missing materials. They say, apparently, Your Honor, apparently concerned that these missing records would be helpful to the defense, or detrimental to entities acting in concert with the Biden administration, the Jack Smith prosecution goes to great lengths to resist the production of these materials. And they make various claims, incorrectly, that the requested records are not sufficiently relevant, they're not specifically specific, or they're not admissible. And so despite claiming that the requests are not sufficiently described, the prosecution and Jack Smith and these deranged thugs over there strangely and they falsely claim that President Trump already has access to the materials that he seeks. And so these objections are meritless 
and Trump's defense is going to go through each one of them in turn, making the argument that they need those subpoenas to go get those missing January 6 records. But before we get into the rest of this, a quick message from our friends. Now, we're back with the motion from Trump's defense. And the first area that they're going to attack, they're going to say, that we need these missing January 6 records because our request was specific. We're not just asking on a fishing expedition to go get missing documents just to, in hopes of finding something. We know what we want. And we know that if a subpoena is not specific, it might fail. But these records meet the threshold. They say Trump seek, seeks records concerning the disposition of these specific records, the loaned and the now missing committee records. And we remember what happened. They were just bundling these up, having people sort of redact and delete portions that they didn't want before they became archived. They say the committee, undoubtedly, Liz Cheney and Crying Kinzinger's committee, would not have given control of the records to other government parties without discussing the matter internally first. And likewise, the committee, the J6 committee, almost certainly communicated with agencies that took possession of the missing records. So they know where they went. And so the subpoenas request only these communications about where the documents went, where they ended up, to whom they landed, and so on. They're specific, they're highly relevant, they're not overly broad, and they lead to an understanding of why the committee tried to conceal these materials. Why did they just get deleted? And your honor, the letters state that all or most witnesses and their interviews were recorded. So when Liz Cheney was bringing people like Clavicle Girl around into their offices, they recorded them. The video recordings of the transcribed interviews and the depositions, which featured prominently, which were featured during Liz Cheney's hearings, were not archived or transferred to the House Administration Committee. Why didn't they save the depositions and the interviews, the videos? Why not? It's a cover-up of epic proportions, noting that the committee did not archive all video recordings of the interviews or depositions because they were not useful to them. Trump seeks these recordings, Your Honor, and we need to subpoena to do it. It is hard to imagine a more specific request than that. Now, they say that the government claims that we've already produced some of these materials, deranged thugs have, but carefully declines to say whether it has produced all of them. And to the extent that it has, President Trump invites the prosecution to identify the records with particularity and to verify that they have, in fact, produced all the materials that the committee, quote, loaned to any government entity. Now, of course, the contents of the subpoenaed tapes could not at that stage. Now, this is a quote from another case. They say, Your Honor, Chutkin, in fact, it should be trivially easy for the government to locate and produce the recordings of the January 6th committee and what they created of the witness interviews in the ordinary course of business Presuming, of course, should be very easy. Okay, this is the government. They should have all of these records. Presuming, of course, that the committee did not delete the recordings specifically to ensure that President Trump and other political opponents could not obtain them, which appears likely. And that would be, in my argument, we'll see if they get there, the deletion of exculpatory evidence, which should result in a sanction against the government leading to the dismissal of the entire case. Right? If they're deleting evidence that might exonerate your side, that's in the government's possession, and they're not providing it to you, I would argue for a dismissal on that. I'm sure they will. Now, they're still trying to say that we should get this stuff first. They're going to try to get it. Right? That's, that's several steps down the road. Get a subpoena. Give us the materials. Let us investigate it. When we can't get it or we try to get it and it's not there, boom, that's the motion to dismiss for that basis. Now, in sum... Your Honor, Chutkin, the requested subpoenas here in no way resemble a fishing expedition. We're not just throwing a shotgun approach out here. The kinds of documents that Trump seeks are narrow. They're specific. We want video recordings of witness interviews, the records that the committee shipped out the door just before shutting down. And we want the correspondence related to the same. Who got the records? Where did it go? Follow the chain of custody. Saying, Your Honor, based on the four letters attached as exhibits, these are the records respondents would be aware of and can easily locate. Indeed, the records were significant enough to engender a dispute among members of Congress about their disposition. And Nixon, in a prior case, in the specificity prong, 
here is satisfied from that case. So we have satisfied that request for our subpoena. Okay, a subpoena has to have specificity to it. The subpoena has to have relevance and these other factors. They say, judge, by the way, this is very relevant. You know why? Here, the committee materials, and especially those that were transferred to government agencies in some procedural trick to avoid their archival, are manifestly relevant to this case. Trump, in this case, is being prosecuted for January 6th, the so-called insurrection. And here, the committee's entire purpose was to investigate the events alleged in this indictment. And conceding the obvious relevance of that investigation, the prosecution here, Jack Smith's deranged thugs, has produced large quantities of the committee material in discovery, okay? So Liz Cheney and the fake illegally constituted select committee were like the first version of a, of a grand jury that's been impaneled to investigate a crime, but they did it politically openly in front of all of America, bundled the whole thing up, and then just delivered it over to Jack Smith. It's, it's wild what's happening, but they did it. So two, should President Trump have the right to obtain the vital committee records? If they're gonna give some of those records, we should have all of them. Saying that the committee tried to segregate those materials and they tried to avoid archival and then later their production, they deleted them. And they give us some examples. They say, Your Honor, Jack Smith's thugs are saying that they don't actually need to deliver the video recordings because they're superfluous, because the, the videos are not needed because they're big files. You know how much data a video can take? It's a lot. You don't want to save all those hard drives. And they say, so we just have transcripts. So transcripts is enough. Uh, wrong. They say, not so. First, video conveys, conveys far more information about a witness's demeanor, tone, and expression than just some regular witness transcript. And second, many of the transcripts produced by the committee, they're not signed, they're not otherwise adopted by the witness, meaning that the recordings will be essential to establish their authenticity and will also be needed as impeachment evidence if some witness denies making those statements. And we've made this point too. Like if you look up Ray Epps's depo, his transcript of his interview, it's like a joke. They don't even tell you who's speaking. There are run on sentences like, an automated transcriber could have done better. They got some kid who's just brand new to typing class and they're like, hey, Johnny, can you come over here and uh, practice your typing skills for this very important congressional meeting? I'm like, yeah, Aunt, Aunt Liz, I'd love to. So third, notwithstanding the committee's footnotes that nonpartisan professional official reporters produced the transcripts, no, definitely not, okay, they were garbage. It provides no indication who these individuals are. Exactly, it was Johnny who's nine years old. And many transcripts do not even say. Thus, many transcripts lack the typical markers of authenticity on their face and may never be authenticated. And fourth, many interviews took place via WebEx and other methods. It appears that numerous transcripts were not created in real time by a court reporter sitting in on the interview, but they were reviewed after the fact from the videos that Trump now seeks, okay? So there wasn't an actual court reporter. They're like doing it in reverse. This presents a best evidence problem, okay? We don't want their transcript. In other words, they have the videos. And when they request the videos, they then transcribe the videos and give them the transcripts. And they say, no, we want the best evidence. Give us the videos. Don't give us the transcript of the videos. And a court reporter transcript of a video is not a substitute for the video itself. And this is what is so gross about all of this. If Trump is such an insurrectionist, why don't they just publish all of it? Why did they delete any of it? Because they know it's fake. We know it's fake. They also continue. They say, for example, President Trump is entitled to all the evidence regarding widely reported decisions made by Nancy Pelosi and Mayor Muriel Bowser, who specifically declined to have the National Guard come that was authorized and made available by Trump on January 6th, even if the committee wrongfully disposed of those materials before disbanding. You're saying Trump committed an insurrection without charging him with that. So we wanna know what Nancy Pelosi was doing and Mur Muriel Bowser as well. Finally, your honor, the requested subpoenas seek information that is relevant to motions for spoliation of evidence 
and due process violations based on unlawful coordination between Jack Smith, NARA, the committee, and others. And this is going to be another issue that explodes. The idea being that the documents were not illegal. Then there was a request to make them illegal. Then NARA reclassified them to make them illegal. And then Trump got indicted because the documents were reclassified as illegal. Now, they continue. The fourth prong. Judge, why we should get subpoenas for this, which I'm sure she'll deny, says the requested records could be admissible as public records. They could be used, all these reasons why we could admit these, okay? Like, they're not going to be not admissible. Give us a subpoena, and we're going to be able to use them. They're not going to be precluded. We can use them as public records under 8038. We could use them to refresh a witness's recollection under FRE 612. They could be admissible under the residual clause under FRC, FRE 807. We could serve as impeachment materials under Nixon and others. A lot of different ways we could use them, so therefore they are admissible. And finally, Your Honor, they say President Trump has a constitutional right here to due process, to fair trials, to the right to have counsel and to get evidence. So counsel has the right to go and get a subpoena to require people to compel to evidence, to produce and compel them to produce the evidence. Saying that Jack Smith and those deranged thug prosecutors and their resistance to the requested subpoenas is emblematic of the injustice that pervades this case. First of all, they're not giving us the material and they're fighting us when we want to go get the material. Like this, these are prosecutors. If Trump is dead to rights in this case, they should just give him everything because he insurrected us so badly. But why are they deleting evidence from the defense? Trump, at the prosecution's request, has been repeatedly and unlawfully deprived of a fair and meaningful ability to defend the charges against him and to prepare for trial. He can't even read the evidence. So there's like eight or 12 Washington monuments worth of evidence now. His attorneys made the argument. It's like reading 70 copies of War and Peace every day per attorney or something. It's insane. So the prosecution is now opposing these subpoenas. It is the latest effort by them to impede Trump's right to a fair trial. They don't even want him to get the evidence that he needs. So, Your Honor, they say, permitting Trump to gather this evidence before this trial such that the defense may fully review these materials and incorporate them into their strategy implicates the core of the Sixth Amendment right to the effective assistance of counsel. Your Honor, we're the lawyers and we can't do our job if you can't allow us to go get evidence that we need to do our job. So saying ultimately, the Constitution guarantees Trump a fair opportunity to review the discovery, to compel the evidence, and to prepare a defense. And so without the request of the subpoenas, this guarantee that Trump is guaranteed under the Constitution will be undermined. And so the court should grant our requests and issue the requested subpoenas. That's the final word from Trump's defense. And we're going to watch the judge deny these subpoenas. And I'm sure she'll explain that it's duplicative. It's not necessary. Uh, she can't make the government do certain things. We'll probably see a separation of powers argument in there and other nonsense. And so we, of course, will continue on. We've got Judge Chutkin, who in addition to very likely denying those subpoenas, and we'll see if Trump does something about that, but also is denying Trump's defense access to information about what the prosecutor is sending to the judge. I know that sounds convoluted, but let's walk through this. Chutkin is also now denying Trump's request to see some of the classified information that is being used in this case against him. So Trump not only may not have the opportunity, the permission to go track down evidence via subpoenas. But the government can also hide things from him under the SEPA rules, Classified Information Procedures Act. Let's watch. This is the opinion in order. This is coming from Judge Chutkin herself out of the District of Columbia. She says, all right, everybody, both sides, Trump and deranged thugs. Before the court are two motion. First, the government, deranged thug Jack Smith, they submitted a classified it's called an ex parte, in camera, under seal motion for a protective order. Now, a lot going on. Ex parte means that they're not notifying Donald Trump's side about it. Okay, they're not showing the other side. Normally, you show the other side. Do you agree with this? Do you know, do you have a position on this? Do you object or not object? Do you take no position? 
but they're just submitting this without even telling Trump what they're submitting. In camera means that they're asking the judge to look at it behind chambers, kind of you know, off the record on her own. So that's not even a part of anything officially. In cameras, behind closed chambers, in the judge's chambers, off the record, off the floor of the court. And it's under seal so that it'll officially never be a part of the record. And what they're asking for is a protective order. Okay, so that protective order is presumably going to go and protect against something. And typically, as we've seen in this case, that means that Trump is being limited. Okay, they are protecting the court system against Trump. That means Trump gets gagged. Trump can't do certain things. Trump can't communicate about certain things. Trump's lawyers can't communicate about certain things. They can't even notify the press about certain, like nothing. Like, do you see how many layers of seal this is? Trump's people have no idea what's going on, like at all. And so the government filed it and they, and Trump's people knew about like that filing. Uh, but other than that, there's nothing in there. They just know that it exists. So, so Trump submitted a motion for access to the filing, right? Trump said, okay, the government is asking for a protective order that Trump can't see. They did disclose that they filed the motion. And so Trump responded and he said, Hey, we want access to that thing. A motion for access to the filing. So the judge says, eh, sorry, no access. I am going to grant the government's motion, which gives them a protective order over the defense that presumably Trump has not seen. It's been filed under seal in camera, ex parte, and it's classified. Okay. And they're going to, and they're going to deny Trump's request for access. So he can't see anything. Do you see what kind of a psycho government this is? What kind of a psycho, like we read about this in the Count of Monte Cristo, you know, when Edmond Dantes was locked away and they said, what are my charges? What are my crimes? What are my crimes? Can't see any of it. No idea. Whatever they say it is. So the judge is going to keep Trump's defense in the dark. They say the government's motion requests that the court pursuant to SEPA, conduct an in-camera, in-chambers, ex parte, outside of Trump review of the government motion. They've got declarations in there. They've got exhibits in there. We can't see any of it. Neither can Trump's defense. Okay, like I would understand if we can't see it as the public, but Trump's defense could. Not even Trump's defense can see it. And two, they also want to authorize the government to withhold from, from discovery certain classified info and provide an unclassified summary substitution for certain classified info, okay? So they're just gonna say, uh, Trump people, you just get like a nice little blurb that's totally unclassified and we don't have to give you any of it. They're also granting order that the entire text of the government's motion, so everything in that filing and the accompanying declarations and exhibits all of which are classified, shall not be disclosed to the defense and shall be sealed and preserved in the records for the court to be mailed, made available during a future review of these proceedings, burying the whole thing. They say the court has carefully reviewed the motion from Jack Smith and the declarations and exhibits. And we conclude, says the judge, that it was properly filed ex parte and in camera and under seal says, initially, the court finds that the classified information referenced in the motion implicates the government's national security and their classified information privilege, right? The government has the privileges. Accordingly, the information is only discoverable to the extent that it's relevant and helpful to the defense. And the judge says, well, I reviewed it. And based on its review, the court and its discussion with the defense counsel, during a recent ex parte hearing, the court finds that the government's proposed summary of the classified information adequately describes what Trump and his defense team are going to need. And, and that's it. As a result, the motion satisfies the standard and provides good cause for withholding those materials. So government is granted. Now, Trump and his attorneys, they say, well, how about we can just see it? Can our attorneys, can we have attorneys eyes only to what you're trying to do so that we can at least see what your arguments are to the court. They say the court has discretion to give us access to that. And they made their arguments. But at the outset, 
The judge says it bears emphasis that the defense identifies no case in which any court has ordered the relief that they've received, received. And this court is aware of none. Well, isn't that interesting? Do you know why, Judge Chutkin, do you know why there's no precedent for a case like this? Because it's never happened before. Gosh, the court is aware of none. Guess what? There isn't any precedent because a president has never been prosecuted in a kangaroo show trial court like this. There is a good reason for that lack of precedent, as they say. The House report explains, since the government is seeking to withhold classified info from the defendant, an adversary hearing with the defense knowledge would defeat the very purpose of the discovery rules. And in any event, they say it's not possible to isolate the... Un so in, in, in other words, they've written the rules to support the fact that they don't have to disclose things. Like the government and the intelligence agencies have created a law that protects them because that's what they do. So she says, in any event, it's not possible to isolate the unclassified portions of the motion in a way that could meaningfully be litigated. So it's too sensitive for you guys to see what we're doing to your own client. Now, the judge says, as you might expect, the government's discussion of legal principles is sufficiently interwoven with the evidence. So even what the government is asking for is so intertwined with the evidence in the case that we can't even tell you what they want. So the judge says, rather than take this unprecedented and likely futile, futile course of trying hopelessly to unentangle these things, we're, I, what I decided to do is hold an ex parte hearing with the defense counsel to see whether this would be relevant. And when we were there, they said the presumption against ex parte proceedings, it, we don't like it when one side talks to the judge. That is insane. Like, that's not fair, is it? No. Both sides should be able to talk to the judge and get both sides in. But the, th that is not happening here. The defense may be right, saying, well, one side is grant or graded access. But on their face, those points contrast rather than compare the SEPA regime which expressly, like the judge is deferring to the law. She says the law says, if it's classified, we can do ex parte proceedings. And I don't care if you have security clearances, you're still not entitled to see this stuff. So none of these points make me want to deviate from ordinary SEPA procedures. And so that's what I'm gonna do. Unlike other sections, I don't have to follow this. The sole case cited by Trump, which again, Trump can't cite any cases because no president has ever been prosecuted before and gone through this. And so they identify no court since that time. And so this court is not gonna be the first, but of course this court will be the first doing a lot of other things. And so for the reasons as articulated by the judge, the government's motion to hide evidence and to seal evidence and to secretly talk to the judge is granted Trump's request to take a look at the evidence is denied. The government is now authorized, according to Judge Ch Tanya Chutkin, our American government, so-called, of justice, now has permission to withhold from discovery the classified information in its motion and to provide some unclassified summary to Trump's defense. And all of the materials, all of the motions, the memo, the ex exhibits, all of the additional documents shall not be disclosed to the defense. They shall be sealed and maintained in a storage facility under security of a classified information security officer for review when appropriate. So Trump, once again, gets no evidence at all because that's just what they do. They're cheaters, they hide evidence. They don't want the public to see any of this because what they're doing is, in my humble opinion, unconstitutional and illegal and unethical and disgusting and antithetical to American ideals but that's what's happening in so-called uh, uh, courtroom in America. Judge Chutkin, very likely to deny the subpoenas. Now, we're going to continue to cover it, and we know Trump is going to be appealing a lot of this stuff because there will be collateral consequences that will impact the election if he doesn't win on some of these issues. We'll continue to cover it, my friends. Thank you for subscribing, and really, thank you for sharing this. You know, I don't think that many people know about what is happening. Like, how can you have a justice system if a defendant cannot even see the evidence that is being lodged against him in the process. Reprehensible, we'll continue to cover. Thank you for inviting somebody to come here and join us and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one. All right, my friends, now we've got one final segment to attend to. And this time we're going over to Colorado to see some of this show trial. 
And again, as a forewarning on this, the audio on this is bad. Now, I, I'm going to try to adjust it in real time to make it a little bit better, but it's still not so good. So they're trying to figure it out, and there were some warnings to not get on the, uh, not get on the good audio. So we're going from C-SPAN here. C-SPAN is the, um, the entity where we're pulling the audio from. And let's get queued up and ready to go. Day four of the Colorado removal trial, and we see a familiar face come in and testify. His name's Ken Buck, representative from Colorado. He's not going to be running for re-election, kind of had it with the Republican Party, he said. And we've been critical of Ken Buck here because he often sides what, with what feels like Liz Cheney and that side of the Republican Party. But today, he came out and actually testified against the January 6th report and said that it was incomplete because it did not have a minority report that incorporated the Republican characterization of what happened. There was no counterbalance. There was no adversarial proceeding at all. And there were other witnesses who also testified on behalf of Trump's defense, and we'll get to all of them. We're gonna start off with Amy Kramer, who was there as part of the Stop the Steal rally. And she testified to be the opposite of what was promoted by the petitioners, the people who are trying to keep Trump off the ballot. They say that he committed insurrection and that there was this right-wing extremist movement that was afoot. But this woman is now going to be explaining the nature of the crowd. It wasn't insurrectionists. These were good people. Okay. Um, so, did you go to the speech? On, let's, let's talk about the speech, on the, the rally on January 6th. Were you there? Yes, I was. Hey, can you describe what it was like? It was cold as hell, number one, but um, it was the same type of atmosphere. You know, people had come from all over the country and um, they were concerned because they believed the election had been stolen. And I mean, same type of thing, you know, it was very, very uplifting, patriotic, and just full of love. I mean, happy people dancing and um, dancing. just waiting to see their president. And what kind of people were there? Were there, you know, individuals, families? What kind of what kind of people were at this event? I mean, I would say every. I mean, all you know, many types of people. Um, we had elderly people there. We had blue collar workers there. We had professionals there. There were donors there. Um, it was it was a, a you know just a wide variety of people that were there. And did, were you there for uh, President Trump's speech? Yes. And can you describe the reaction of the crowd while he was speaking? Well, these people love President Trump, and so they couldn't wait to see him. And, it, I mean, they're cheering for him. And, you know, when he does his speeches, he, he plays on the crowd, and they're very reactive. And so it's the same type of thing. It, it's the same type of thing that you would see at a Trump rally. And were you seeing any anger in the crowd? No, no, I mean, no, not at all. And, and as you were listening to President Trump, did you get did you get the feeling uh, that he was telling people to storm the Capitol? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And when when he when he talked about fighting, what was your understanding of what he meant? Were you was he looking for physical fighting or was he looking for political? No, he was like metaphorically, you know, political. I mean, we say fight like hell all the time, or, you know, we never back down, we continue to fight. I mean, that, that is not physical fighting, that's metaphorical. And, as, and, and so when, as President Trump was making his speech, I want to kind of redo this again, um, and making the statements about fighting, how was the crowd reacting to that? I mean, I can't remember specifically, but I'm sure they, I, they're cheering him on, you know, and bringing with him and encouraging him, that sort of thing. And then after, this, after President Trump finished speaking, um, what, was, what, could, what was the emotion of the crowd that you could see? I mean, people were happy. They came there. You know, to, the president was there. They came here to see their uh, president. They were 
president. Many people have never been to Washington, D.C., so it was like a highlight of their life, and people were just happy that, that the whole event was a fantastic event and lots of love. Okay. Um, if We're going to play uh, a, a lots few of videos love. for you here. So we're gonna skip the videos. They had a lot of technical difficulties with the videos, but Amy was coming in to explain that it's not insurrection, it's not violent mob of people who are trying to take over the Capitol. It's people who were there from all over the country, happy to be there in support of their president to protest a rigged election. And so she was joined by representatives, Paul Gosar's former chief of staff. His name is Thomas Van Fleen. And he's going to explain that BLM and others were there and they were causing a ruckus. We'll get to his testimony right after a quick message from our friends. Thomas Van Fleen. Now, he also was brought in into the trial, the Colorado removal trial, day four. And he is here explaining that other people were involved like BLM and they were there causing a lot of ruckus. But the FBI didn't raid all their properties and investigate them. Here's what he said. As again, we're trying to show the counter side to this, right? It was not a planned insurrection. Donald Trump was not trying to cause a, a, an insurrection at the Capitol. Here is the testimony from Thomas. And can you describe um, the rally for us in terms of what the crowd looked like to you? To me, the crowd looked like uh, a typical middle aged Pretty cold that day, and uh, but people were in a good mood. People were singing. People were uh, listening to music. They were broadcasting music with the loudspeakers. It was pretty festive. Thank you. And did you uh, take any videos that day? I did. And did you take a video of Vernon Jordan, Vernon Jones speaking? I believe I did. Yes. Okay. Could we play uh, Exhibit 1082? Yes, Your Honor. There's an objection. Your Honor, we're not presenting the, uh, the, the video to show Vernon Jones is speaking. Where it actually shows the crowd as he's speaking, and the point is to see the crowd. Like I said, this is not about showing the speaker. Okay, it's going to be you. Okay. Just, just a minute here, uh, Mr. Van Flyn. We're working through technology to get the. They're playing this guy. And they're showing the crowd, right? He's speaking. Everybody's laughing, having fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. America. So, Mr. Van Flyn, in that video, uh, you panned around to the crowd. Um, was that a good rep was what the crowd looked like in that video a good representation of what you saw when you're there that day? Um, do you know if there were and any? Can you describe of the again? Hang on, who, I, I uh, um, accidentally opened a separate video. Who, That's our next clip. We're going to get to that one. Let's go back. after the video again for us what how you view the crowd that you saw in the video crowd that i saw next to the um, you're going to have to speak, speak up or get closer to the microphone mr van flying sorry okay the crowd that i saw that i walked through on my way there and walked um, through on the way out and was next to was just that way they were cheering they were chanting usa sometimes they broke out uh, singing, praying, and it was, like I said, more like a festival in a rally. There was no anger. And, and did you see any hate or anger among the crowd at all? 
not when I was there. And, um, and you said you left the uh, rally around 1045, is that correct? Did I get that time right? And then you walked back to the Capitol, is that correct? And did you see anything notable on the way back to the Capitol? On the way back, you know, uh, it was still very calm. There were, you know, isolated groups of people walking. Some going still in the direction of the rally to attend the rally, and some going the opposite direction. But on the streets at that moment, there was nothing. And and did you see anybody with uh, BLM shirts at any time on that during that morning? I did later on in the morning. I uh, walked over to Capitol Hill Starbucks and walking back. I was on the south side of uh, Independence Avenue, and on the north side there were a couple gentlemen wearing BLM. T-shirts or shirts, rather, maybe not T-shirts, but B BLM shirts. And they seemed aggravated uh, and, and loud. Uh, and and were they kicking signs or anything along those lines? Uh, they did indeed, and they were chanting loudly and just seemed visibly agitated. And that was they were by the time I saw them, we were by the approximately by the Jefferson. Uh, Library of Congress, which is right across the street from the Capitol. Yeah, well, we didn't hear much about that narrative. It was all just the Trump MAGA insurrectionists, not the BLMers or the Antifaers. We didn't see the FBI come out, lecture all of us about that potential for violence. And of course, that's because it was on the favored political side. They needed to use this setup to exploit one political party in America, and that was the right side. So we've got this other clip. This is from a Republican Party treasurer. His name is Thomas Borklin, and he went over there. He was hanging out. I think he was going to share with us a little bit about his reaction in the crowd. Here's what he said. Okay. And um, can you describe describe what the crowd was like, or the people in the crowd? Uh, very friendly. Um, there were. It was diverse. There was a lot of. There was actually a, a big line of people that said Asians for Trump and they were really super nice and um, you know we were talking to them and just I mean everybody was just there and having a, having a good time listening to those speeches. Okay. Um, what was the temperature like outside? It was freezing cold. Uh, it was windy and the um, camera was very cold. Okay. Um, yeah. How, I mean, can you give us a sense of maybe how big the crowd was there with the ellipse? Uh, I'm guessing, like, if you look at the whole crowd, maybe 350,000. Okay. Um, let's look at exhibit uh, 1002, please. So what happened with this guy, they played some videos from him. And we fast forward through it. He's just out walking around. Now the judge is going to ask him some questions. All these motorcycles pulled up, and I thought it was pretty cool. So I took out my camera and started filming. Um, there are um, these Harleys, and, and then the horses came up, and I believe that was Park Police. Um, and my brother was saying, "God bless you guys." And there was a woman there, and you could hear her in the background. Um, and people were just kind of. Ms. Rubo, would you mind disorienting for me? Like, the judge is asking some questions. Where were you, where you specifically? Where the speeches were happening? I know you said you could hear them on speakers, but like, mm -hmm. how far were you from we, where, where the action was happening? Yeah, um, the speeches were kind of boring, and, uh, <laughs> and so we we just decided to walk across the street from the Washington Monument, and we went over to. I think there's a World War II monument. There was a monument there, and we wanted to see that. And so we just walked over there to, to take a look. And, um, and then, um, and that's where the park police were. So it was very close to where we were actually at. You can see the monument right there. Um, how, how far was the monument where you were on the original video from where the speeches were taking place? Um, it was probably 100 yards or a couple hundred yards. So a few football fields? Yeah, a couple of them. 
Thank you. Sorry, I'm just not, very, not wanting to get I was planning on going there next. No, no, which is fine. I just want to make sure. I, do you have a good understanding, Your Honor? Do you? No, you're. He is. A, he's an open book, our, Mr. Bjorklund. So, uh, but I want to make sure. Do you do you have a sense of comfort having a sense of where he was? Who was there? And was the crowd continuous from the monument to um, where the speeches were taking place? Yeah, there it was very packed. Um, it was less so by the monument. I think most of the crowd wanted to be closer to Donald Trump, and you know I wanted to be more away from the crowd. <laughs> Go ahead, sorry, Mr. President. All right, so that was a lot of what we saw. Walking through exhibits, communicating about what the crowd was like, where they were. It was a lot, a lot of very, very peaceful people there. And they charged a bunch of people with not even violent crimes. And so a very small subset of people were even charged with violent crimes. And the question was, were those even valid charges? Of course, we disagree that they were. Now, I want to share with you, this is Ken Buck. Ken Buck came over from Colorado. He's a representative from the United States Congress currently. Will not be running again because he's kind of had enough of it. But this is what he said when he was testifying. And he walks us through the problems with the January 6th committee report. We know that the committee was basically illegal, as far as I could tell. Supposed to have a certain number of members. It didn't. It didn't have the requisite number of Republicans. Supposed to have five. Only had two supposed to be a total of, I think, 13 people, eight and five, and it wasn't. It was nine and uh, seven and two. And so it wasn't even lawful under its own orders in the House of Representatives, but Nancy Pelosi cobbled it together nonetheless. But this is now Ken Buck, who's explaining why the committee and the report was so bad. Um, do you know if there were any members on the committee who... Um who subpoenaed or produced evidence for witnesses that were um, supportive or uh, sympathetic uh, to the proposition that uh, January 6th uh, was not an insurrection and was not caused by President Trump? I'm aware that uh, Leader McCarthy, um, when he made the statement that we would not be assigning Republicans to the uh, January 6th committee, after Speaker Pelosi had um, uh, denied uh, the, the assignments to Jim Gordon and Jim Banks, um, Speaker or uh, Leader McCarthy said that he was going to have a separate investigation, and that investigation would be our side of the story. Um, and uh, there were some uh, witnesses who were uh, who testified, and uh, there were some documents uh, produced, uh, not through subpoena. And um, uh, had those been uh, part of the January 6th uh, report, I think the report would have been more important. Uh, I'm sorry, the report would have been more complete. Okay. complete. I mean, um, it is it fair incomplete. to say it would have been more balanced? Um, I, I think if you're uh, looking for balance, um, uh, yes, I, I think it would, have, it would have presented both sides. Okay. Um, let me ask you about that separate committee real quick. Did that committee have any subpoena power? It did not. Um, did it have any ability to compel the production of documents? It did not. Um, or witnesses? No. Okay. Um, You're about the January 6th no, Your Honor. I'm talking about the uh, separate report that Representative Buck referred to that Speaker McCarthy had created. Let me just clear up the record, Representative Buck. Um, we, Let me correct you. It's not Speaker McCarthy at the time. I'm sorry. Yes, Leader. I, I just want to help clear up the record a little bit. Um, so your testimony was that um, Minority Leader McCarthy had sort of established a separate committee, correct? Well, I wouldn't call it a committee because there were no Democrats on, on his efforts, um, just as there were well, I shouldn't say no Republicans. Um, there were no Democrats on his efforts. Were uh, I think Jim Banks um, and, and a few others, uh, Kelly Armstrong, were on this other group that was uh, formed to investigate. Okay. Um, let me let me go back to the um, the January sixth committee. Um, you said there was no minority report produced by the January sixth committee. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And why is that important? Oh, because it provides. 
provides the other side of the story. Um, uh, it provides a context for what both sides is alleging. Um, and it is important to, uh, to have the, uh, the, I believe, the full picture in, in uh, a situation like the January 6th investigation. Okay. Um. You had said when you spoke with um, uh, Representative Jordan that there were things that he said um, that were. All right, we're going to fast forward through this and we're going to just get to the other portion where he says that essentially what his conclusions were. So let's hear from Ken. With respect to the January 6th report, have you. Um, what's your view on it from a political standpoint in Congress? Well, I, I voted to certify the election. Um, I thought what happened on January 6th uh, was uh, obviously bad. Um, it was a riot in, in the Capitol building. It was meant to disturb a, uh, a proceeding. And I uh, felt that the, uh, the, the parts of the report um, that I saw um, described uh, those things. It, it went beyond that in other areas. Um, and uh, that's where I think the, the cross-examination in terms of the president's culpability uh, would have been important. Yeah, it would have been nice if we would have had a counter conversation during that so we could have had an alternative narrative. You put po both of them up together and you decide which one seems most believable. But they just gave us a book report for like eight days. And with the deficiency... Oh. And why do you think it would have been important? Because I think that um, in order to be able to judge someone's call, it's like going into a courtroom as a prosecutor and not having a defense counsel to defend it. I think in order to be able to judge someone's call, you know, you've got to be able to hear both sides of the story. And in this case, uh, there, there was not a, uh, another side. Uh, there were people who voted to impeach the president because they made a judgment that he had, um, uh, had been uh, involved uh, in the uh, uh, January 6th uh, uh, um, events, and uh, the the other uh, the other side uh, was not present for, for one reason or another. Was not present to be able to uh, portray the other side of the story. Yeah, for whatever reason or another, it's because they didn't want the other side to even have a say in the conversation. So Ken Buck, surprisingly, coming out and giving us some good points on that. Yeah. Would have been nice if we had an adversarial proceeding. You know, we don't just have an adversarial proceeding with two sides just because it's like the default for some dumb reason. Like we just did it that way. It makes sense to have both sides advocating for their side. And then the trier of fact, in this case, the American people can decide for themselves and we can go vote on it. But that's not what's happening here. The January 6th select committee cut out one side just like what they're trying to do in this courtroom, which is to cut out one party. Donald Trump, they do not want to be on the ballots in a state in the United States because they say he's an insurrectionist. We're on day four of this thing. We'll be back. There will be a lot more to cover. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for inviting someone over to our channel and telling them to join us on our daily live streams. And we'll look forward to seeing you both on the next one. All right, my friends. Well, that is it for us on the day. We covered some good ground. Of course, the Colorado trial. We covered the January 6th DC trial. We covered the New York City trial. Man, there's just a lot more going on. And now, my friends, it is time to hear from you. And we're covering a lot more stuff that we can't get to here on these live streams on our member-only streams at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. We do streams in the morning. We do streams on Saturday. We do after parties over there. And we got a lot of fun stuff cooking. So come check us out, watchingthewatchers.locals.com, where you can get some extra content and meet some really amazing people. We also have our website, robertgovea.com. So if you want to get access to this mind map and any of the PDFs that we cover here, Robert Govea is the place to do it. We put the PDFs on the website. We summarize the segments. We bundle them up, send them in a newsletter to your email so that you can forward them to your friends so that if you have to bail out of the show after the first five minutes, you get an update on what is coming across. And so that, my friends, is where you can find us. But now let's hear from you and see what you have to say about this. 
from our friends on the YouTubes, on the Rumbles, of course, on the Locals, and we'll check out what's happening over on the X platform as well. And so, we got Dark Side Digital kicking things off for us. What's up, Dark Side? It's a birthday for Dark Side, says, just wanting to say first and happy birthday to me. And so, big happy birthdays for Dark Side Digital. Hopefully, you're having a beautiful birthday today. Thanks for stopping by and saying hello, and we're wishing you a beautiful one. From Dark Side, we got another one's in the house. Coming from our friend Wendy K says, what's up, Rob? Trump is in Houston right now. Watching on RSBN while waiting for Rob. Rob's lives are worth watching the replay. If it wasn't for all of you, I would watch the playback of Rob and watch Trump live. Watching RSBN. So you're doing you're doing double duty, man. It's hard to, to, to double program against Trump, man. You know, should do you think we should bump the show when Trump's scheduled? We get bumped, bump ourselves? Well, we'll miss you if you can't join us live, but you're right, it is on record. And so we're glad that you, to get you when we get you. Thank you, Wendy. We have this one from Catherine Rack says, what's up? Hey, Rob and mods, keep up the great work. And I, I agree with that. Shout out to the mods, mod in the fourth down for us. And thank you, Catherine. We got Raymond Loera says, is heresy a crime? Those judges don't like critics. Well, I don't know that it's a crime like heresy, you know, like the, I don't think it's the right word for it, but I, I think you could say that uh, well, I guess maybe you could say heresy is a crime now in America. I guess maybe you could. Yeah, if you're a heretic, like to, to climate change deniers or something like that, they'll find some reason to prosecute you. If you're a heretic to the nation state, they'll find, they'll, like Elon, they're coming after him. If you're a heretic to the democratic ideal, yeah, they may come after you. So I think you might be onto something, Raymond. We've got Sleek Boar coming in as a member. What's up, Sleek Boar? Very nice to see you. Thanks for joining us as a supporter over on the YouTubes. And don't forget to grab the Telegram link. Our YouTube friends, grab the Telegram link so you can find us on the after party as soon as we're done here. We got Crash is in the house. Crash says, ex parte, in camera, under seal, ambush. Will Trump have access before it is used against him at trial? I don't think so. That's I didn't see anything like that. So much for due process. Yeah, I think she just said in case it comes up at some other point, maybe later, like after the case is closed, we'll look at it or something. I don't know. But she didn't say that they were going to get it. She said they're going to get a summary and that's it. So pretty insane, isn't it, Crash? Says, Rob, if these guys created an umbrella law that protects them, maybe it's time to dump some tea. What do you think? Well, I do, I do enjoy myself a nice cup of tea from time to time. In fact, there's some that will put you to sleep quite nicely out there. I don't know if that's what you're talking about, but what I envision for uh, the future of America is peaceful political activism where we join together in overwhelming numbers, wake up our people who were not awake last time, make sure that they're activated and join us when we go to the polls and vote in overwhelming numbers to overcome the margin of fraud in the entire country and just bring back Liberty in America. That's my plan, Crash. I, I know you're here for it. We got this one from Kimberly B. What's up, Kimberly B? Says, thank you, Robin team, for all that you do. We do have an amazing team. Shout out to the mods. Shout out to our meme smiths here. And to you, Kimberly, for being a membo for two months. Woo. First month's the hardest, man. If you can get through the first month, second month is much easier. We got this one from Fred Pedamonte. Says, to the chat, Joseph K. in Kafka's The Trial is Trump. Joseph K. in Kafka's The Trial is Trump. From our friend Fred Petamonte. Good to see you, Fred. And this one is from a bad poet. It says, save all your notes, Robbie. Your book detailing the biggest RICO conspiracy in U.S. history. J6 and the Trump prosecution more than Fannie. So I'll save all these mind maps and convert them into a, a book chronicling this corruption. It's not a bad idea, a bad poet. Catherine Rex says, can, can't we file an ethics complaint on Chucky, on who, Chuck U. Schumer, or on Chutkin, uh, Chutney the judge, Chutkin, Judge Chutkin? Uh, you could, I mean, you could file an ethics complaint, but I don't, think, I don't think you'd have standing for it. They would say, well, you know, it's a complaint, but were you directly impacted? And the judge would say, you know, they would just throw it out. I mean, you could, you're like, the answer is always, yeah, you can. But is the question, is it going to go anywhere? No, definitely not. So a bad poet says, 
History tells us dictators always declare martial law with justification like wars, etc. Never have they marched peacefully and patriotically. FYI, USA. It's a good comment, a bad poet. I think you're right, yeah. Dictators don't march peacefully and patriotically. They just seize power, as we've seen. We've got this one from Jigum says, Mr. Trump, are you saying that watching the watchers has the best coverage of these sham trials? Jigum says, Trump says, correct. Correct. Let me see if I can find that one. Yes. Here, let's pull that one up while we're here. Jigum's in the house. We're going to pull up the, the actual GIF in the house. And that, my friends, thank you for those incredible donos. We're going to jump over to the X platform to see who is saying hello over there before we wrap it up and go over to our members only after party. And so come and check us out. But over on the X, what do we have cooking? We've got that one, but we're not there yet. We've got to go to the, to the memes, to the Trump correct meme. And we're scrolling up and boom, there it is. Correct, correct, correct. And while we're here on Locals, don't forget to smash that like button, baby. Woo, hit it. Thank you for smashing that like button and for joining us. Now, let's see who's over on X before we go over to the after party. We got 13 viewers, man, 13 viewers. We're out of control over here. And we've got Fred says that Garland, Wolf, and others, they don't seem to grasp history, Fred Petamonte, and that history will portray them as demented. Danny McWilliams says, this makes me sick. No doubt. And we've got Feline Fun says, I know there's a lot to cover these days when it comes to Trump, but the below is interesting. Minnesota also hears oral arguments on an effort to keep Trump off the ballot. Oh my gosh, we're going to have so many cases to cover. I didn't know there was a Minnesota one. Wild. All right, Christopher says, hey Rob, longtime watcher, big fan. Thanks for all you do. Thanks, Christopher. Question, could the bad audio on these clips be intentional? Seems like a very odd thing to have happen. Well, I don't know. So I heard... Uh, from our friend Roger Parloff. Roger Parloff does a lot of good reporting on this. And he, uh, there were like three feeds going on. There's a public court feed that you can get on the website that is not recorded, that apparently the audio is good, but the exhibits are bad. So like they have like half the mics plugged into half the crap. So you get exhibits, you either get exhibits or good audio. You don't get both, pick one. And so what we, and, and also the other one, the, the ones with good audio are not recorded. So basically we're kind of stuck with C-SPAN. And somebody on YouTube yesterday said that if you logged into the good feed, you'd get in trouble from the court. She was scolding lawyers who were doing that or something. So we're trying to make do, and I don't know if you can tell, but I have a, a volume knob right here. And so I try, I'm adjusting it in real time. So like when it's loud, I turn it down. When it's low, I turn it up, try to make it better, but there's only so much you can do. So old drill sergeant is here. We got spuds is over there, Cynthia Doyle is over on the tubes talking about the various statutes over there. And so it's good to see our friends on the X platform. We also have the watching the watchers community on the X platform. If you're over there, just pop on over, say what's up. We're still not sure what exactly we're doing with it, but we are uh, congregating at a local watering hole on the X platform. And so come and check us out over there. But that my friends, is not it for us on the day. We got Stephanie Womax says, Rob, what would happen if they somehow blocked Trump from the ballot in Colorado? Well, I mean, I think I, ultimately, I think that there, these would all be appealed and go up to the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court would settle this. And I don't know how they would settle it, but if they settled it by saying that the states can govern their own elections, then maybe they say the states can do it. And if the states do it, then Trump comes off the ballot. And that's probably the game, honestly. Like they don't need all the states, they just need a couple states to do it. And if the Supreme Court doesn't rectify it, then, you know, that's it. And we'll see what happens to the country if they try to do that. It's not gonna be good. So good to see you, Stephanie. Now, I don't know that it's gonna go that far. I have a hard time believing the Supreme Court is gonna do that because I think that would like literally cause a very, very big problem in this country. And I don't think anybody wants that, especially me. Now, NY says, Regarding the insurrection, how is inaction on Trump's part a valid accusation for insurrection? Trump cannot be prosecuted for executive decisions. Well, it's a good question. I think Doc, it would be like, 
you're a doc, you'd be like if somebody came in and you failed to do something that you knew you were supposed to do or that you had a duty to do, they would say that you fell below the standard of care by not operating on the person even though you knew you should and you didn't do something and you kind of should have. So I think it's like falling below the standard of care argument is really what they're saying. But I agree with you. What Trump did was not that. It was not falling below the standard of care. It was an executive discretionary decision that there, there's no right or wrong answer to. The standard of care of, of, what, of a president is what the president says it is. And political questions that come from Liz Cheney that says he should have done something differently, they don't cut it. And so that, my friends, is it for us on the day. Now, we're not done yet. Membos, stick around. YouTube members, grab the private Telegram link on the community tab section. We'll see you there for our after party. Watcher, watching the Watcher's friends, stick around on the locals because that's where we're going for the after party. You can also go to robertgovea.com, sign up for the daily newsletter. I know you want more stuff in your inbox. I know it. And of course, check out ground.news slash RGE and we'll see some of those uh, promos coming out. We're grateful to our sponsors and the people who help support the work that we do here. But before we get out of here, it's mods and meme smiths thanking time. And so we want to say thank you to our friends, Vianti Kiss Prime. We got K Bean, Just Cause, Playin' Hooky, Ronnie Cole, our friend Zulu, Beyond Geo, Zach Nichols, John Allen, Janek909, Dog Digger, and our friend Donut Mind Me, who is clipping away for us today. Thank you, Donut. Along with our meme smiths, Jigum Gigum, memeing down the fort for us, Nathan NA10, and our friend Sleepy Dogly over on the X platform. But that, my friends, is it for us on the day. We are going to be back here tomorrow with a lot more to unpack and business to attend to. And I hope to see you right back here so that together, with your help, we can shine that big, beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency down upon our system with a hope of finding justice. Make it a beautiful night, my friends. Sleep very well. I'll see you right back here tomorrow. Bye-bye.